guys, it's Sam and I'm here at the Boston Teen Author Festival with Roshni Chakshi. Hello! And she is the author of the wonderful Astonished Queen and the forthcoming A Crown of Wishes. And that comes out in March of next year? March 28th, 2017. Oh my gosh, right around the corner, right around the corner. <laughs> So we are here today because we have been longtime fans of one another and talking a lot. So I definitely wanted to talk and touch base with her. So we're just gonna get started. So I think the first thing that everyone is gonna be expecting from me at this point is we're gonna talk about Hades and Persephone. <laughs> because that is our bonding point. That's true. Point. It was the aesthetic that guided my like outfit today. I was like, oh, I'm gonna see Sam. Right. I gotta I gotta dress it up. Exactly. Some blood red eyeshadow. <laughs> Some like, right, strange black. oxidized jewelry. <laughs> right, right. So my big question, I guess, is Hades. Persephone is a big, you know, theme for the first book. And where did you, I guess, get introduced to Hayes Persephone, and you know, to have that as your inspiration? So I, um, I really started getting into that mythology when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And so in high school, we read Paradise Lost, and my teacher, we, you know, we came across the line, that awesome line that Teen Demigod me was all about. And I was like, I would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. Right. And I was like, oh, <laughs> yes. I bet that boy is cute. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of thought, so that sparked all of it. But my teacher was the one who brought up, well, what if you applied it to a different myth? What if you applied it to the Hades and Persephone story? Mm -hmm. And I loved that idea because it gave so much more agency to the Persephone character mm -hmm. than most people realize that she has. And you've spoken about this mm -hmm. in your videos about how her name was something that people did not say. Mm -hmm. There was like this huge cult surrounding her and whatever else, and she's quite terrifying. And I love the idea that maybe she had fallen in love and chose to be queen of the underworld versus, oh no, I was tricked into eating the pomegranate. Right, like, right, girl. because I got <laughs> tricked, you know? Like, yeah. I've talked about this before, so I'll yeah. link my video that she's referring to up above. Yes. I was like, but, I don't believe you. Right, yeah. So I guess you were talking about like Persephone taking back her agency and that yes. being a huge thing, and yeah. it really is a modern idea mm -hmm. that people in mythology were taking back their agency and stuff like that. Yes. So you definitely wanted to have protagonists that do that. And mm -hmm. how different is the protagonist of Star Touch Queen versus the new protagonist? That we have, who we've been introduced to before, yes. but we're getting to see a little bit more of. So, how are so, they different? I don't think it's a spoiler ish. Maybe it could be. So, just don't complain. <laughs> don't complain. Don't <laughs> complain. Uh, so, it's about Gowry, who's Maya's little sister. And Gowry just has a lot more emotional baggage than Maya does. And she loves her country, but she's always stuck in these sort of power wars with her brother. So, I feel like she has a lot more guilt that she's trying to work through and she's, you know, I, I really wanted to explore when we talk about strong female characters, and honestly that, that term is beginning to grate on me right. a little bit, but it's this idea that she's strong only because she has these masculine characteristics of a super swords person or like she's no emotions. Or, yeah, yeah, no emotions. So I wanted to explore just stoic and introversion, but that's because you, you really are hiding a lot of emotional depth. I mean, she is warrior-esque, but that's not all that she is. Mm -hmm. So that's how I think she's mm -hmm. different. And I absolutely love her, and I cannot wait for to meet her. <laughs> I'm so excited. So Star Touch Queen is inspired by your Indian Filipino culture. Mm -hmm. And is there an element or a story from your heritage that you wish that people would use more that you would like to see in future stories? Not one that necessarily you can write, because you don't want to like spoil it for anybody, but something that you just wish that people would use that they just don't know about, that Western world hasn't adopted, I guess, yet? Mm -hmm. I know. There's a lot of beautiful love stories and a lot of the Hindu mythology and so much of it comes from like the plays of Kalidasa or the Mahabharata and the Mahabharata is this epic um, epic poem written in Sanskrit where one of the holy books in Hinduism, the Bhagavad Gita, is contained inside of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like, oh my gosh, there's a story called Shakuntala which is this something that really inspired me with the Star Touched Queen. Mm -hmm. It was a story that talked about memory as something tangible that you could hold on to. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the story of Savitri and Satyavan. And I think that actually appears as one of the nested stories inside the Mahabharata. And it is another one of these death in the maiden stories, but it's uh, it's where the woman is the trickster. So I really, I love it. Like this Savitri, just goes through hell and high water to get her man back. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm here for it. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's, yeah. it's a fantastic story. I feel like the little bit that I do know of Indian culture is you do have these stronger characters, whether they are stoic or not, but you mm -hmm. kind of have these women being powerhouses, mm -hmm. even if it's an understated way, that you don't have a lot of Western myth and stuff. And yeah. it's like, so why aren't we using this more? Because mm -hmm. I just feel like it's very kind of ignorant of like Western society to not be adopting these. And I'm hoping in the future, since it's kind of 
turning that way, and like we said, with agency, that we're going to see more of that. But right now, it's like we don't have enough of it because it's just you only have these little touches. And yeah, you know. I also think it's because we don't quite know how to talk about them. Like, there's this one female character in the mob out of the just left. Hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> And her name is Amba, and she has this vengeance arc where she comes back essentially as a man okay. just to vanquish this one person. And it's a question of like, is she really a man? Is she not? And, like, this gender fluidity, and it's just fascinating questions that are raised. And so people don't know, like, well, what part of the story are you focusing on? Because it's asking so many questions all at once. Yeah. So it's hard to track. Yeah, I mean, all of these sound really fascinating, especially with like the gender fluidity, like you were saying. There's so many things you could explore with that, and we just. I feel like a lot of authors haven't tapped into that yet, so I'd like to see more of that. Yeah, me <laughs> too. <laughs> so kind of going off of that, are there any stories that you wish you would have had as a teenager growing up that you would have liked to have seen and that maybe are coming forward now? It doesn't even have to be a story that we've seen now yet, but is there something that you wish that would have been explored more for you as a teenager? You know, I really loved Marion Zimmer Bradley's Miss the Bat One, and I love our theory of retellings. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons why I think I was, I am obsessed with the Winner's Curse trilogy by Mary yeah. Rutkowski. It's just very different kinds of feminine strength mm -hmm. that I wish were celebrated more because when I was a teen and I was reading these books, it was a lot of like, am I beautiful? I don't know. Right, the wilting flower. Girl, you no. Know. Right. <laughs> you know you're cute, right. don't lie to me. <laughs> right. And I, and I wanted more to it than mm -hmm. that. Um, and I want characters like, I, I also really love Marie Lou's The Young Mates and the character of Adelina. These rather vicious, savage women. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I love the most, but I have been dying. I don't know if this is good, I can say it, whatever. I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> I am dying to maybe one day do a retelling of Gone with the Wind. Because it's my favorite, and Scarlet and Rhett are my OTP <laughs> for life. And right. Scarlet is just awful. Right. She's just like an awful human. Right. But I dig it. And it's nice to explore those kinds of characters that are in between like that, and yes. kind of giving young girls, especially, a right to be vicious, like you were saying. Yeah, you can celebrate being a survivalist. Yeah. And that is exactly what Scarlet O'Hara is. Uh -huh. And like charismatic to the point of it's almost toxic, right. which I love. Like, I think the first line of Gone with the Wind is Scarlett O'Hara was not beautiful, but men seldom realized. You know, you just have that force of personality. Right, right, yeah. Uh, so I loved it. Yeah, especially because we live in a society still that tells women to be small and be quiet and yeah. stuff. And yeah. just having teen girls see these characters that are like, right. I'm not going to be, yeah. and it's okay. And that doesn't make me like not feminine, mm -hmm. you know, is really great. Because obviously Scarlett O'Hara, feminine to the extreme, yes. Yes. but still that powerhouse character. Yeah, she just she wields it. Yeah, I love she's it. She's great. <laughs> yeah, my mom's gonna see this and be like, oh my god, God with the wind. She's gonna be so excited. <laughs> I love it. So kind of switching gears a little bit, mm -hmm. as far as like social media and stuff, which is a huge thing now, and you're very active with your fans. I mean, obviously, like I talk to you on a regular basis. So how do you feel about like new and younger authors kind of getting engaged with social media and that fine line where before authors were so separate from their fandoms and now it's very much like a major part of being an author and having like, you know, a persona almost but not, yes. you know, kind of being professional in a social media way where like usually you're not really supposed, you're supposed to be really real and it's like you have to have that fine line. You're like asking the question that has just been like plaguing my life, like, am I authentic? No, I'm like, I am. Like, I am. Like, right, this is me. genuinely me. Uh -huh. But you know, the thing with social media is, and you really have to remember, and this is advice for just young writers as well, this is a highlight reel, you know? Mm -hmm. These are when you kind of edit your best life and put your best foot forward. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it's not genuine, but it also means that someone is crouched behind the curtains, pulling the strings, and showing you what they choose to share. Like, I don't share bad days yeah. on social media. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't share when like I have a writing day that's really tough and feels like it's ringing out my soul because that's just not what I, I want to share. Right. And it's private. You have to keep some stuff private. You have to do keep some stuff private. And I think, you know, the wonderful thing is that we now have so much accessibility to our readers. And it's so gratifying to hear from someone that I really love this book. Um, or what are you working on next? And it's really valuable. But at the same time, you know, you kind of worry about are you listening too much to right. the reader? Like, oh, they really love this one aspect. Did I make sure that I amped it up enough in the mm -hmm. next one? So it's really a question of being able to tune out other people mm -hmm. and just focus on yourself. And I think social media especially can make people kind of, it gives you life envy and FOMO. Yeah. And it's like severe, like, oh, but did I do that? Like, should I do this more or right. better? And really it's just, we're like in a high school and I'm like, eyes on your own paper, just uh -huh. focus on you. And mm -hmm. That's what I feel about it. Yeah, it could really be a double-edged sword in a lot yeah. of ways. I mean, that's yeah. the same thing with like booktube and everything else. And it's just like, okay, this is really helpful. This is this community. But at the same time, it's like, 
okay, well, I feel like I'm having a really bad day and this person's doing really great. And it's just, yes. even if you're not being jealous, but just being like, I'm having a rough day. Yeah. And, you yeah. Know, so it is a good resource, but at the same time, balancing that, I'm sure yeah. it's difficult. It really is a balancing act. And I'm curious to see how it changes for authors in the future mm -hmm. when it comes to like interacting with readers and you feel like you know them and you recognize them. And how do you just maintain those boundaries and make sure that you're not putting anyone in an awkward position mm -hmm. because you do know stuff about their life and, right. you, and you want to just know, like, well, how do we converse? Right, <laughs> right, exactly. And as yeah. far as um, social media and stuff and Goodreads and yeah. reviews, oh, um, yeah, so how do you feel? Like, every, I always ask authors because yeah, everybody right. goes mm -hmm. a different way with it. Um, do you look at the bad reviews? Do you look at any reviews? And what do you take? Do you take anything from that? Kind of mm -hmm. like you mentioned, when you see, like, a good thing that people love, it's like, yeah. okay, do I have to now kind of like cater to that and fan right. service that? I mean, it's right. hard to decide. Yeah, because you, you want to make your readers happy. Like, yeah. because I love you readers. You're the best. You you let me do this and eat off of this light. You know, right. like, yeah. it's, it's phenomenal. But, you know, I did used to read reviews. Mm -hmm. um, and that was... Not for me. Right, it, it can go down. I feel like if I started it, writing, I would be the same way. Oh, like, it, really, I can't. it broke my soul. Mm -hmm. um, and that was rough. And so I actually had a couple of friends. I asked them to filter out for the three star reviews because I felt like those were a little bit more judicious of this is where she kind of fell down a bit or whatever. And yeah. take some craft points away from that mm -hmm. because I did learn from, mm -hmm. from those mixed reviews. And mm -hmm. they did teach me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but to an extent, you know, you can't please everyone with the book that you're writing. Right. And at the end of the day, you just have to make sure that you are honoring the book that you wanted to write. Right. Right. And uh, to that end, if if, a, if the Star Judge Queen made one reader smile and shout about it to their friends, I have succeeded. Right. I have done my job. Yeah. If you didn't like it, that's okay. I mean, hopefully I'll be writing more stuff. Maybe you'll check it out. Maybe right. you won't. Mm -hmm. um, just don't be rude. Right. But yeah. Of, sometimes like the, like the, what is it? the targeted where it gets a little personal right. is strange mm -hmm. and I, I feel like that goes back to this question of um, having so much accessibility between like these two worlds mm -hmm. and you feel like you're judging a peer right. or something as opposed to an artist and separating them from their work mm -hmm. so you know I think it's something that we'll just readers and authors will figure out together. Yeah, it's a very different time now because before yeah. it used to be where you just have like the, you know, publications that mm -hmm. would do like the star reviews, you know, like Kirkus and yep. New York Times and everything. And now you have people yeah. like myself and other people like me who are doing reviews and it's like, okay. Which is amazing. Right, <laughs> which is Thank really fun. You. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm sure it's very different because it's like, if you're not necessarily professionally trained in it, there mm -hmm. are people that do get really nasty with authors about stuff and attack authors where it's like, I'm okay with somebody attacking a book, but don't mm -hmm. attack the person behind it because yeah. it's like, Yeah, yeah. So. Such like a deep question. <laughs> I'm like, okay, like, Sam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and okay, so we are currently at a YA festival. This is all teen authors. Do you ever feel like, obviously here, everyone's friends, everyone's friendly, we're all in the same community, but on the outside, do you ever get feel like you get judged for writing YA? Because there is that kind of... You know, that... I do, actually. You do. Yeah, like sometimes they'll... What's their name? Like, <laughs> what's their name? <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask. Right, exactly. No, I think they, they mean well, but I guess, um, you know, growing up and coming from a family of people who did not do creative things, mm -hmm. but just went to a lot, of, a lot of doctors in the family, a lot of business people and stuff. And I've been very lucky that my family's been so supportive. But sometimes I'll go to like these family friend parties or whatever, and it will be the question of, when are you gonna write something grown up? And I think that is, that's a disservice to storytelling. Right. It's a disservice to fairy tale retellings, uh, which is like my bread and butter, mm -hmm. and that I love beyond reason because you know, the reason why we retell them so often is because you can see yourself in those stories. Mm -hmm. You can pour your heart into them. You, you can be that character and be the hero and the heroine, and that's so valuable. Mm -hmm. And we really just shouldn't dumb down children's literature when it is constantly one of some of the most powerful stuff that you see out there. Mm -hmm. And I also feel like, especially with genres like fantasy, that is where we take very difficult questions and address them in the abstract. Mm -hmm. And it, it gives us a way to turn these ideas that are really controversial, controversial and very shocking into something palatable mm -hmm. and just to work our way through them in a different way. So, so yeah, I mean, I do get black for that, but that's just silly. Right, it is silly. I think yeah. it is changing. I mean, it's definitely, but we have, as reviewers, get black too. And I read a variation of adult and YA, but you just still get that like, Oh, booktube is just YA, and ooh, and it's just like, well, even if it was, yeah. why is that a problem? I mean, yeah, there's a reason why we love talking about YA, mm -hmm. because we can see ourselves as these characters, and there's something really addictive and thrilling about these stories where we are one with the main character. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's so powerful. Mm -hmm. And everyone has been there, even if you're going through it currently, or you're reading it as an adult, and you're going back and kind of being like, there's so many YA books that I've read and been like, 
oh wow, like uh, that was my experience, and it's right. really. And when I was a teenager, I didn't have those books because they were popular. You know, you didn't have one. Yeah, I remember when I finished reading um, Alexander Lloyd's The Iron Rain, mm -hmm. I was sobbing because I thought he did a very beautiful and respectful take on ancient mythology in this book, and it's a it's very ordinary in the sense that it is cut and dry hero's journey. You can like Joseph Campbell the whole thing, mm -hmm. and but it's. We, we never get tired of those stories. They give us so much hope every single time we write or read them, so I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. So kind of going off the same thing, what do you want to see moving forward with the YA genre? Like, What are, what are your hopes and dreams for YA going forward? Obviously, a lot more inclusivity. I think Six of Crows is like one of the best books I read last year, and it just did it mm -hmm. perfectly. Mm -hmm. just, oh my god, the writing, the plotting, and the characterization. Mm -hmm. You have these morally gray characters, you have characters of different levels of uh, ability mm -hmm. and just different skin tone shades and right. it's dressed right. and, and it's still, it doesn't, um, it, all it does is just make the story come alive. Right, much more sure. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it just gives it so much more dimension and depth and I just loved it so much. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely what I hope for and I would hope for more Persephone-like characters. Like, give me more, like, we're like naughty. <laughs> yes, we're like, like yes. Like, we want it. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, give me more savagery. Uh -huh. Give me like girls whose cosmetics is a weapon. Right, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, our I, aesthetic. Like, yeah, our aesthetic. <laughs> I'm such a huge romance fan, and I kind of feel like we're moving towards YA that's a little sexier. So, uh, you know, like, I would not mind some of, some of that. Right. <laughs> so, not kind of moving forward to your, like, writing process, do you use music and stuff when you write? Like, do you have soundtracks to your books that you kind of have and like, that you think of? I sometimes do. You know, for me, it's like I listen to the music to get into the mood of a story, mm -hmm. and I have some of the most amazing readers out there who make these beautiful fan playlists. Yeah. And I, I, I promise you, I listen to them. I listen to them, I'm like, whoa, you are so right. I did not think about this. Right. And I've never heard of First Aid Kit, but they're cool. <laughs> Scandinavian folk band. Like, now I sound Perfect. really exciting at parties. I'm like, I don't know if you've heard of so and so. Right. Um, so yeah, so for me, like I listen to a lot of it as just mood writing stuff. Mm -hmm. I love listening to uh, musical scores. And what I'm working on right now has me listening to a lot of symphony kind of stuff from the 1880s, and I love it. Right. I dig it. And then, you know, I'm from Atlanta, and so there's a lot of Lil Wayne <laughs> right. in there. Right, but like battle music, you a know? Lot, yeah, it's like the battle music. Um, so that's that just a lot of hip hop. Awesome. A lot awesome. of hip <laughs> So as far as for the Star Touch Queen, you edited and rewrote this book a lot. Oh so God. yeah, so how many times did you have to like go over it about? Like 12. Like 12, okay, 12. see? And so, I did a complete and total rewrite in the middle of my first year of law school in a month. And I broke my wrist. Not really, but like they're really. But they they're, felt they're like never it. the same. <laughs> right. Never the same. Right. So, what kind of advice with like NaNoWriMo and stuff coming up? Mm -hmm. What kind of advice do you give to writers who are getting discouraged during that process, where they've written their draft and oh. they've gotten that out, but then they have to edit it or rewrite or whatever? Like, what what are some advice that you have for them? So, I always say this, and I say I'm probably going to say it fifty thousand times on panels, but honor your story and don't rush. There, there really is no expiration date for success, and I think that. You're just going back to the social media and stuff. Remember that what you're seeing with these stories and interviews is highlight reel. Mm -hmm. So nobody's going to tell you all the time all the struggle that you go through for that one story. Mm -hmm. And even if that draft that you end up with is not your debut, it still teaches you something. Mm -hmm. All of those drafts are precious. All of them teach you a little bit more about yourself and your writing style. Um, and the other thing is, sometimes I talk to so many brilliant young writers, and they're always like, I have so many ideas, and I don't know how to pick and choose. Just flip a coin. Mm -hmm. Flip a coin or go with your heart, but do not cheat on that story. I will know. <laughs> I will know, and I will be side eyeing you. So, like, stick to one story, mm -hmm. you know. And, and Neil Gaiman said this best write things, finish them. Mm -hmm. Just and that's important to the end. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes the most helpful thing to me is when I get to the end of a page and I'm on the next one, I don't look back anymore. Mm -hmm. I do not self edit until mm -hmm. I'm completely done yeah. because, you know, I know it's going to change, and I sometimes think it takes three drafts to figure out what the book wants to be, so I end up with almost 100,000 words on the cutting floor of not a book, mm -hmm. but that's fine. Right, because so you're, you're still looking Yeah, around. you may end up writing around your book for a year, mm -hmm. but that's okay, because it led you to the book that you needed to write. Yeah. So I guess kind of wrapping up, as far as moving forward, what do you kind of have coming on the pike that you can talk about, or stuff that you want to kind of give a little hints for, because you have, you know, the one that we already talked about, with there's stuff coming down the pike, and do you want to like kind of hint yes. anything that you can, because I know some stuff oh you can't. Oh my gosh, I don't think I can. <laughs> you not <laughs> I do any of it. I'm, I like want to, 
Hmm. Watch my so there, Pinterest. Right, there are okay. things, but you know, I yeah. Yeah, don't yes. want to say too much. Yeah. Obviously. But there are things coming up after and you know, moving forward. Yeah. Stuff, which is really fun. Yeah. Secrets. Yeah. <laughs> so this is us from Boston Teen Author Festival. Thank you so much for trying for joining me. Yes, this thank you for time. having me. So thank you guys all for watching and I will see all of you guys soon. Bye. Bye.